costs extremely important in when cases get settled and for what amount. They're crucial to lawyers downtown. I want to in in introduce the, the, this subject to you in this lecture, but it's of tremendous importance to practitioners. And I want to start with something called a payment into court, an offer by the other side to settle the case. It's a formal offer to settle. There's a very important effect which this formal offer to settle has. If you're a claimant and the other side make you an offer and you go on and litigate even so and you get to court, you don't get as much as in the formal offer that was made to you earlier on, you will be punished. You will have to pay, as it says in that note, the costs of both sides from the date of the payment in. In other words, you should have taken the payment in. And as a result of that, you've litigated unnecessarily, you will bear the costs of both sides. Now that payment in would, at one time, be placed great pressure upon claimants only, because the payment in could only be made by defendants. Back in, until 1999, it placed great pressure upon claimants. Now think what it's like being a claimant. Claimants have been described as one-shotters. It's their one chance to deal with a very large sum of money for those who've been seriously injured. They are only going to be in that court once. The claimant is risk averse. Can you imagine what it's like sort of being faced with an offer of half a million pounds or whatever, some much larger than you'd otherwise see in the course of your life? Are you going to turn down that and bravely go on and fight further? We know that individuals are risk averse when it comes to large sums. Think of uh, uh, game shows on television. People are quite happy to gamble for the first 16, 32, uh, 100 pounds, 200 pounds, how far. Do you, but when you get up into the uh, uh, half a million re range or 100,000 range, uh, even if I give you very good odds of two to one, I bet you'll take the 100,000 pounds rather than gamble uh, or, or, or for more money, even though the odds are two to one in your favor. You'll be risk averse. People adopt a conservative betting psychology. There's all sorts of pressures on them anyway. They need the money. The, the case has been dragging on for a long time. They're worried about the fright of having to appear in court. They're not sure about the uncertainty of the whole system. Their lawyers explain the uncertainty to them. There's all sorts of pressures on them. But the conservative betting psychology of a claimant is in sharp contrast to the insurer. The insurer is not a one-shotter. The insurer in this classic division is a repeat player. The insurer will be back in court again with other cases the next day or the next month. The insurer is not risk-averse. The insurer is risk-neutral. They're more prepared to run the risk of losing an individual case. It's not their money after all. It's not their personal financial future. Um, this is summed up in, in, in this quotation which comes from the survey I did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, what does the lawyer say? The problem for your client is it's, it's their one shot. They're very unlikely to have another CSNG that's going to have an effect upon them for life. So basically, the idea of a risk to them is worth more than it is to an insurance company. The insurance company has got a whole stack of cases. And if they get it wrong on this one, somebody might get told off. But ultimately... They can, they've got another 50 or 100 where they'll get it right. So insurers can be a lot more clinical about the risk, really, because if they get it wrong, they can make it up on the next one. So classic solicitor telling me about risk-averse claimants and risk-neutral um, uh, insurance companies, although he never would have heard those terms. Um, the result is... Claimants are very prepared to accept an offer. Look at this. I've got two studies down here. Um, Gen's study back in 1984, 63% of first payments, formal payments, are accepted by claimants. Two-thirds of the first formal offer that you make as a defendant are likely to be accepted. And yet, if the claimant hangs on, look at that next figure. The second offer is going to be up to a third to a half higher than the first. 
The motto you might think is, well, hang on, hang on. But that's not what happens. Two-thirds of first officers accept it. Now, a, a somewhat later study from 2002 again shows 33% only settling off the first office, but 66% after two. And after three offers, it's 90%. How do you explain that? Uh, what's the reasons for that? Reasons, question mark. Um, well, it's costs for the claimant. They're worried about the danger of having to pay those costs should they lose the case. It's from the inexperience. But we could transfer that to the lawyer as well, couldn't we? If it's a lawyer who's inexperienced, he's going to be wanting the certainty of a win, not the risk of going to court. He's going to be terrified, perhaps, of having to prepare for trial. Perhaps he's not been to trial before. He's inexperienced. Cost pressures. I'll talk to more about that in a moment. If he loses this case, he'll be losing all his disbursements. It could cost his firm a fortune. And from the insurer's point of view, of course, they say the first offer is accepted because... They're very good offers. We pitch our offers right. We are fair in making the offer. Now, which do you think is right? They make fair offers? If you were an insurer, wouldn't you realise that claimants are under a lot of pressure? That the claimants are wanting to settle? You would know that two-thirds of the claims offers you make are accepted? I bet you'd make a low offer, wouldn't you? So, the number of low offers are accepted may be an indication of under-settlement. It may be an indication of inexperienced and taught lawyers who don't know that the system works as well as they should. But it also may be an indication of risk-averse claimants who are desperate not to go anywhere near a court and who are desperate to get some money in now. But those are the stats. Those are really interesting stats, aren't they? Um... The system was revised back in 1999 so that offers now can be paid not only by claimants, but by, by defendants, but by claimants. So defendants also could be under pressure. And indeed, they have a penalty nowadays. If, if you as a claimant solicitor make an offer to a defendant and, they, uh, and you go to trial and you, they, they don't, are not able to match what you would have offered them, in, in your formal offer, the court can punish the defendant now like they can punish the claimant. The punishment is the court has a discretion to award the claimant interest at 10% of a bank rate. It can be a significant punishment. Indeed, in, in many cases now, we see not only pressure upon claimants, but also pressure upon defendants to settle claims early. They can be punished if they don't settle claims early. And indeed, defendants, as I've said to you before, are very, very worried with regard to small claims that the costs of the lawyers who outvalue the claim settle the claim early. They're under pressure too to settle claims early. But they're not as risk averse as claimants. Well, that's a simple uh, 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 introduction to costs in terms of offers and formal offers and the payment into court. In the past, of course, you didn't have to worry so much about costs if you were qualified for legal aid. Many cases were brought with the benefit of legal aid, um, which resulted in great pressure upon defendants, of course. The claimant could litigate without fear of costs, um, but the rate at which legal aid was given was gradually cut back more and more. Uh, the pay for lawyers was cut back as well. There was declining eligibility, and eventually uh, uh, we ended up with legal aid being abolished in 1999, except for a very limited number of cases, of which one still exists. Uh, the clinical negligence claims for babies who suffer a brain injury at birth still can be brought with the assistance of legal aid. Um, but with the abolition of legal aid, what took its place? Ah, this is the phrase you know and know only too well. The conditional fee agreement, the CFA, known as no in no fee. Now, don't get confused by the, uh, the American situation in the USA compared to Britain. The USA has contingent fees. Not conditional fees, but contingent fees. What do we mean by that? In the, in the States, 
Some of the richest lawyers are personal injury lawyers. It's the richest part of the American legal practice in many respects. They are really multi, multi million pound lawyers. Um, why? Because they charge a percentage of the damages which the claimant gets. They charge a percentage of the final damages. So, and the, what percentage? Well, commonly 30 to 40 percent is what you take in the States of the claimant's damages. It's a contingent fee. If you lose the case, nothing. Win the case, 30 to 40 percent. And you know what that's like in, in a catastrophe case or there's multiple claimants, a disaster case? That's where the mega royals operate. Not in this country. What? We have conditional fee agreements. Now, the conditional fee agreement allows you to not, not, you can't charge your client a fee if you lose. It's no win, no fee. But if you win, you can charge a success fee. But wait a minute, it's not tied to the percentage of damages eventually obtained. You're just able to double up on your usual hourly based fee. So you can get a success fee of up to 100% of your usual fees. Mind you, that is limited in, in road traffic cases. It's 12.5%, in work, 25%. But it's, it's a normal time spent with expertise at whatever your hourly rate is. In Cardiff, for a partner, mm, £250 an hour. Um, but if the solicitor loses the case, she works for nothing. It's no win, no fee, but not on a percentage of damages. The result of that is the personal injury solicitors are very closely involved in the financial risk being run by their firm. You have to understand the risks. If you go and embark upon a major litigation against a major uh, uh, motor manufacturer or drug supplier or, 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 or the Ministry of Defence and they resist and fight that claim, you, your disbursements you know, could be considerable, uh, medical aspects and so on, engineering, technical aspects, long time litigation, tying up members of, of, of your law firm. If you lose that case, as Martin Day did, Lee Day and co, Martin Day is the founder, he spoke here about 10 years ago to the students. He admitted that uh, his litigation with the tobacco companies in uh, the late 1990s, where he sued big tobacco in this country, it failed. And as a result of that, he lost at that time £2 million for his firm. Uh, so your partners in your law firm are going to be looking at your disbursements. So we're going to be looking about how much you're spending, how much you're committing people. And if you're not getting any money in, they're going to be worried. And if you've got a big litigation where the costs are high, they're going to be very worried. You've got to do a risk analysis as a personal injury lawyer and report to the board of your firm as to what sort of costs your, firm is, your, 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 your section of the firm is running up. So what's the effect of conditional fee agreements on your litigation tactics? Well, you're more likely to accept cases where liability is clear, aren't you? Where liability, the best American lawyers uh, don't bother with liability. They're just there to do the damages. Um, uh, in, in a lot of respects. Well, from your, this, in this country, you're not going to be at risk. If you know liability is clear, you're going to get money. Simple road accident cases will be the easiest ones to do. That's where you offer conditional fee agreements. That's the uh, uh, ones where you're least, least likely to be at risk. You will not litigate against Ford Motor Company. You will not litigate in, I put down here industrial disease or medical claims. I was in an associate of personal injury lawyers meeting, I don't know, 10 years ago. I asked how many people were running uh, industrial disease cases, and there were very few, almost no hands. Uh, the, the risk of, of doing that was, was, was thought to be distinctly difficult. Medical claims, similarly. You're not going to get CFAs, conditional fee agreements, in medical claims, nearly so readily. You're not going to be uh, uh, committing money as a law firm to those areas unless you get some money up front. So, also, thirdly, claims are being settled earlier for lower sums, question mark, question mark. That is the suspicion. 
conditional fee agreements have enabled us to take on more clients, but also the pressures are such that you want to make sure you win. And if you want to make sure you win, you settle perhaps earlier, pressure on defendants to settle earlier, and you settle for lower sums. Claimants are being undercompensated because of the fee system. Uh, I'll go on with that. Uh, the effect on claimants, you only pay uh, uh, your solicitor if, uh, if uh, um, they lose the case. You would have to pay, uh, sorry, you don't, you don't pay your solicitor uh, if he loses the case, but what you will have to pay is the defendant's legal costs. However, as I've said to you last time, you could take out an insurance policy to cover you for the risk of having to pay the defendant's legal costs. But, it very rarely happens in any event, but you can actually insure against this. And claimants who obtain that insurance could therefore litigate, and still can, without any risks of costs at all. A conditional fee agreement when accompanied by after-the-event insurance, so you pay the premium for that, you're, you're not going to be at risk. Defendants are under increasing cost pressures. Because if they lost the case until recently, they not only have to pay the damages, they have to pay the solicitor's success fee, possibly doubling the, not his normal fees, and the claimant's insurance premiums, which were significant. Now, well, we had Lord Justice Jackson look at this in 2010. He produced an extensive report on costs in the system. Very, very important report, which all practitioners would know of. And he found the costs were disproportionate. I mean, the costs were too high. The costs exceed damages in cases up to £15,000. And, and below £5,000, they were just ridiculous. They're out of all proportion. Claimants had no interest in controlling the costs. Neither did claimant lawyers. The cost burden upon the defendants was excessive. And following that report, We've had reforms, a number of different reforms. But look, here's some important ones from 2013. The success fee <coughs> could not be recovered any longer. No insurance premiums. There was to be no recovery for defendants from that. As a result, it's no, who, who pays that? If you're going to charge your client twice your, the, 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 the amount you normally would, if you're going to charge your client also for the, the, the insurance premium, where are you going to get that money from? As a claimant lawyer, you're now going to have to pay that out from the claimant's damages. You're going to have to recoup that from the claimant's... Claimants are effectively are paying for the success fee and the insurance premium. Um, actually, the government tried to compensate claimants in a very peculiar and a, a very strange way by increasing their damages for pain and suffering loss of the meeting. Uh, by 10%. I, I thought that ridiculous. So, you know, to, taking away their ability to recover for excess free, their ability to recover for uh, 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 the insurance premium, and you give them compensation by 10% increasing the damages for pain and suffering loss of a meeting. It's like sort of playing Peter. It was completely different. It was paying Peter to rob, having Rob Paul. It was a different sort of apples and pears game, but that's what the government did. Uh, um, in addition, following on from Jackson, Fixed costs have uh, been a feature of the development of pre cost pressures in this country. And also, electronic disposal of claims, electronic claims portals in which you can make a claim quickly and relatively cheaply. That would reduce costs, especially if the claim is worth less than £25,000 and is suitable for electronic processing, various factors that apply. Claims were cut so that, for example, in 2013, here's with the, with the, with the costs that were introduced. For a claim below £10,000, uh, it was cut from £1,200 to £500. Below £25,000, it's cut to £800. Now, that, that's a very small sum of money in legal terms. To only be recover £500 for claims below £10,000, geez, you wouldn't get many sisters. That's effectively two hours' work of a partner. Uh, um, you can't afford partners to have to do that. It's been further cut. I've changed this slide, and this slide's generally were changed like on Sunday, <laughs> uh, because 
we were going to we were going to have a new series of cuts being brought in from April, and the government announced last week that we can't do this. There was going to be an, an electronic portal development, and they couldn't put the IT in place, and they couldn't put the regulations in place. They postponed it to 2020. I've talked to you about this before, but look, this is really, really important for the future of legal practice in this country and access to law. There is to be no claim for, for costs if your claim for personal injury is worth less than £2,000. You get no help with going to solicitors at all. You will not recover any money in costs from the other side if your claim is worth less than £2,000. And in road traffic claims, in road traffic claims, if the claim is worth less than £5,000, no legal advice costs. There's uproar in the legal profession. If you read any of the New Law Journal, Law Site Gazette, claims journals and so on, it's going to encourage litigants in person. District judges are really up in arms. They're worried about being flooded with all these litigants in person which are going to cause all sorts of problems in front of their courts because they don't know what's going on. They, can't, they don't know the ropes. Lack of, lack of representation. April, of course, as you can imagine, are, are, are saying this is keeping people out from the legal system effectively. Um, uh, lawyers, if they're going to act in small claims like this, are going to have to take that, their, their, their costs out of, of claims for less than £5,000. You're going to take it up the, have to take it from the damages. Tremendously important. And that's coming in from August. Now, can you see the incentives of the cost system? Look at look, 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 some of these cynical incentives I've written out here. You can't afford to have partners deal with this. Give it to junior fee earners. The small claims have got to be dealt with by the paralegals. Do the minimum work possible. Settle the case as quick as you can. And I was, uh, I was at one cost. Uh, I, I used to uh, adjudicate or rather report on um, um, uh, continuing education uh, uh, courses for the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. And I was at one particular course. Uh, and, and the uh, speaker said quite openly, you know, well, you're ideal, he said, would be for a double-decker bus to crash right in front of your offices and there'd be a whole series of injuries uh, for all the passengers. You can sign them up straight away. It's all the same event, it's all the same accident, and you can sign them up one after the other. Can you see, that, can you see how the interests of the client and the lawyer is not always the same? Maximising damages may not be what is in the, your best interest of your firm. Maximizing your, your return, your, your, your cash flow, getting money in, settling cases early, dealing with it with lesser qualified people who you don't have to pay as much, that's where you're at. Do you give the claimants the same several level of service you did in the past? No. Do the same level of expertise as in the past? No. The same money as in the past? No. You undersettle, and that's the threat, that's the fear, that the cases are now being undersettled because of the low costs. And here's some quotes I've got. You use junior fee earners. They may, they may do their university degree, but they will not be able to get a training contract. They'll be, end up by being paralegals because they're cheaper. The case will be allocated to a partner. You can charge top rates. And it will have some initial involvement. But in a few months, you'll have the paralegal doing most of the work. He'll always be the first port of call. Do the minimum work necessarily. I see a lot of paralegals being told, I've given you this quote last time, I think, in a particular way. They're under pressure to settle cases. Get your billable hours up. Make sure they can build claims and settle cases. And that undoubtedly affects the level of service they give to the claimant. Well, let me, having sped through those, those, those quotations, which I've given you before, you can see how important costs are. That's a very important tactic, pressure, upon uh, the settlements, and how much you get. It's got nothing to do with what the full value of your claim is. Uh, it's got everything to do with pressures upon claimants and pressures upon law firms to settle claims quickly and, and perhaps at an underrated cost. Um, let me br 